Well, hey, good morning to you this morning. It is good to see you here at Stonesville Community Church. And once again, we are in another installment of the story. Um, And the video has done a very nice job of laying out for us what is happening in chapter 15 of the story. Um, It's actually done a very nice job. And near the end of that video, it talks about different prophets and messengers from God and that's where we're going to pick up today in our message here in in the 15th chapter here of the installment of the story. Uh, We're going to talk about one of those prophets that is kind of alluded to in the video and then also uh, if we go to slide number three I believe it is slide number three uh, in pages uh, on pages uh, 203 through 217 you're going to find um, our, our pages for today and then near the end of those pages 216, 217 or so you're going to find a quotation from a prophet by the name of Hosea Hosea and that's who we're going to talk about today Hosea chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 um, we're going to look at the autobiography uh, of Hosea's life and then we're going to look at some words that he shared uh, in t- uh, chapter 2 verses 14 through 20 and uh, finally chapter 2 verses 5 uh, through 7 I think that's a, a typo there it should just be verse 7 5 through 7 so we're going to be looking at these with you today and our, our theme for today is the love of God it's a wonderful theme and we need to know and not only just know the love of God but to feel the love of God and to experience the love of God and uh, sometimes we need story Uh, We need uh, illustrations from life. And today we have an illustration from the life of Hosea the prophet that helps us to understand and see the love of God. But it comes at an incredible price. Um, Question for you this morning. What radical, outlandish thing might God be asking you to do today? Think about that question. What radical, outlandish thing might God be asking you to do today? If kings are not going to listen, if kings are not going to heed the story, to live out the story, to uh, accurately share the story, represent the story, record the story, uh, pass the story on to a new generation, if kings... And appointed leaders are going to refuse to do this task. Then God has another way of getting his message through. And that those people are called prophets. They are people God chose to do radical outlandish things. So as to wake up his people to some reality. So as to help his people to see some insight that he needed to share. And Hosea is one of those persons, those prophets that God called to do something radical. To do something outlandish. And it's a very, very powerful story. And often God would do this. Especially in the long line of disobedient kings. God would call these prophets, these special messengers, to present their message, and and in many cases it involved their own personal lives. Uh, Some refer to this as kind of the prophetic imagination. It was like street preaching at its finest. What some of these prophets would end up doing in order to convey God's truth uh, to the people. He told, for example, he told Isaiah to walk around in his underwear as a living picture of the horrors of war and exile. Yes, you heard me right, a fruit of the loom sermon. And that is in the story of Isaiah. In fact, the Bible says uh, in some of the translations he was actually naked. But in those days, to be in your underwear was to be considered naked. And so he wasn't totally naked. He was partially clothed. But he was a living illustration of what was going to happen if the people in Isaiah's time would not heed the message that God was giving to them that you know what you're in danger you're close you're on a precipice here the nation is going to is going to be 
uh, ransacked and conquered. And you guys aren't going to be the kingdom of priests that you've been called to be. And so Isaiah was asked to bear this message and he illustrated it very vividly. Um, God asked Ezekiel to lay on his side and eat a starvation diet which he would cook over animal dung. Thus depicting the horrors of war. Uh, many times that would be inflicted on the people which would come if they did not repent of the rebellion. He asked Amos to hold up a plumb line to show the people how out of balance their lives were. And sometimes a carpenter is a better preacher than anybody else or a better king, a leader than anybody else with a message from God. And he asked Hosea to marry a woman and scholars debate this. Was she already a prostitute before he was asked to marry her? Was he... Instructed by God to marry a woman whom God said he's, she's going to become a prostitute later in your marriage. They go back and forth on this. And it depends on kind of, uh, they build their arguments on uh, some nuances and things of the language. But either way, to be asked by God to marry someone, even if you knew she was going to become a prostitute, would be a very difficult thing to do. Hosea, here's who I want you to marry. Her name is Gomer. Now, that, I would have had a problem right there. <laughs> Gomer. I mean, come on. What Gomer Piles, who I think of, is like, oh my goodness, this is a horrible name. This poor lady. But uh, I would have had a problem right there. But to know that, you know, Joey, here's, here's who you're supposed to marry. Or Hosea, here, here's who you're supposed to marry. And by the way, she's going to break your heart. But you're going to marry her anyway. That was Hosea's calling. That was the crazy, radical thing that God was asking this special messenger to do. And so that's why I say today, what crazy thing might God be asking you to do? Are you suffering? Is everything going wrong in your life? Or it seems that everything is going wrong in your life? Are you in the middle of a cataclysmic life meltdown and everything that you ever hoped is being challenged? Maybe God is making you into a prophet. Maybe God is turning you into somebody who can speak into other people's lives in ways that you never dreamt possible. And see, that's how God did it in Hosea's life. And I tell you this, if you love as Hosea loved, if you love as God loved, if you love in the costly way that Hosea loves, you'll be a prophet. I assure you of that. You will have a platform. You will have a message. And it will be powerful. You'll show the love of God to the world. And you'll make an impact. And I don't know exactly how, but you will. And so it's imperative that we follow Him in our brokenness. Uh, for, not, for if we fail to follow Him in our brokenness, we fail to be the messenger He's called us to be in our broken places. And for Hosea, his own life, his own marriage was to be an illustration of the love of God for a broken people in the northern kingdom. We talked about that last week. The nation of Israel, northern kingdom, the ten predominant tribes, they were going to be going into captivity under the Assyrian bondage if they were not to heed uh, Hosea's message. And yet... Hosea lets them know this and yet bundled in all of the thunderous words and prophecies of this great prophet. There was something that happened in his life that tenderized him. That maybe there came a point in his ministry where he did not thunder as loudly as he used to thunder. Because something very personal had gripped his heart. And it was his own broken marriage. And this tenderized the prophet. It didn't take away the message that he had to deliver. He was still God's mouthpiece. But yet it enables him, it, it empowers him to live out a very vivid illustration in the lives of the people who were watching him live his life. And Hosea, 
He preached the Word and He brought the Word and He gave even messages of, you know, this is what's going to happen in your life. Your lives are going to be broken. You're going to run from God and God's going to stay on your trail and He's not going to stop loving you. And someday day He's going to, he's going to uh, renew His... Uh, you're going to renew your marriage covenant vows with God. You're going to renew a covenant. And He's going to uh, accomplish all that He set out to accomplish with your life. And, and, and your nation as a, as a, a, a via a servant, a, a messenger, a, a, a conduit through which the story, the great story of the ages was to flow to the world. And God's going to stay on your trail and He's not going to give you up. So I ask you the, this morning, what crazy thing might God be asking you to do in your life? Are you unexpectedly pregnant? Rather than get the abortion, for example. Everyone does that. What a boring story. You know, I'm intrigued by the stories of the ladies who actually end up having a baby. And those babies now are giving testimonies on YouTube. All over the world. And they're saying things like, I'm so glad I got to live. I'm so glad I know what life is like. And you would not believe the horrendous circumstances that they were, their mothers were in when they conceived these babies. Some of them with criminal intent. And yet these babies are rising up and they're saying, I'm, I'm alive and I'm glad I get to be a human to experience life and joy and to encounter God and see the beauty of the world. What crazy thing may, might God be asking you to do today? Has someone committed a, some great offense toward you? Rather than hold a grudge, everybody does that. What a boring story. What a boring story. Instead of holding a grudge, why don't you forgive and set them free? Now that's a story. Are you, are you still struggling with your sexuality or your sexual identity because of maybe parents or abuse or, uh, and, and those things can be so horrendous? Can I challenge you rather than to dress and present as a female, rather than contend for what bathroom you may or may not use? What a boring story. Instead, what, why don't you face your fears? Why don't you open your life with your struggles? Why don't you let a body of believers love you back to wholeness? Now that's a story. That is a story. Have you had a spouse that cheated on you? Rather than to go off in a rage and hire a lawyer and go to divorce court and of course there are certain situations where that seems to just be almost unavoidable unavoidable but yet it, it's become a monotonous boring story why, why don't we think about doing something radical why don't we take them on a retreat and bestow blessings and arrange a cleansing ceremony for the both of you that's a story You see, we can say a lot about God's story. We can say, and some might say, well, the story of God is kind of boring. Well, I disagree. This great story of God and of the ages, it is bizarre, it is crazy. It is radical, but it is not boring. Because the great God of the ages does things like call people to be prophets when they're at their place of greatest pain. And he raises them up in those real life autobiographical struggles that they have and these individuals catch sight of this bigger story and they begin to be a spokesman, a voice for God in these crazy circumstances. 
And that was the life of Hosea. You know, in today's installment of the story, chapter 15, God's messengers, we look at the life of Hosea. And as I've mentioned already, uh, he was sent as a prophet to the northern kingdom. If we look on slide number 10 on the screen, slide number 10, you're going to see kind of a linear layout of some of the great prophets of God. Some of these guys who had horrible home lives, horrible marriages, they had horrible, horrible circumstances. And these are the guys, these radical guys who said, you know, we're going to be God's message no matter how much it hurts us personally. We're going to be faithful to God. And you can see Hosea's date there right in the middle, 755 to 732. Some would bump that up back to 722 B.C. And so he's prophesying in the final decades of the life of the nation of Israel. And and so God uh, is trying to call His people back to obedience. There's like 19 kings in the northern kingdom. Over a period of 208 years, God was faithful to send nine prophets. Uh, to the northern kingdom and what's really crazy is that the one successful prophet in the nine that we see listed and whose stories that we follow and read and whose some of the Old Testament minor or major minor prophets are named after these guys of the nine prophets only one prophet was successful and his name was Jonah and he wasn't even success in the northern kingdom it was in the nation of Assyria They had sense enough to obey. And this comes in another uh, installment of the story. But Hosea prophesies during the the last decades of the northern kingdom. If we go uh, to the next, I think, slide number 11. Slide number 11. This will kind of give you a little bit more of a layout. Of course, you saw in the video today, you got Elijah at the top. And some of the kings that he had to deal with and dynasties. Then you've got Elisha that follows him. And then you have Jonah and Amos and Hosea. And Hosea is kind of listed uh, vertically because his, his tenure of service, uh, his, his uh, platform that God gave him, his messages to the nation of Israel occurs over this multi-decade period of time. And you can see all the way down, he was a voice that God used. And he kept saying, God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Don't turn your back. Don't go away. Don't go continue going this path you're on he loves you he loves you oh how he loves you he loves you you got to hear this message you got to understand this message northern kingdom this might possibly be averted but you've got to believe that he loves you he loves you and oh did i mention that he loves you and that was his message they weren't getting it and god said to the prophet hosea they're not hearing We've got to up the amperage. We have to increase the volume. We have got to do something radical to get the attention of this hard-hearted, sexualized, idolatrous people who are a product of their culture and of their age. We have got to get a, a, a message through. And so acting on God's instructions, Hosea the prophet married a woman named Gomer who certainly later proved to be promiscuous, perhaps was already promiscuous, but certainly later proved to be promiscuous. And God told Hosea, I want you to marry this girl and she's going to be a harlot, a common street prostitute, but you're going to have three children by, uh, well, you're going to have three children. Uh, one of them will be by her, but uh, she's going to conceive uh, two other children. They may not be yours, uh, Hosea. Two boys and a girl. And when they are born, I want you to name them. I, I want to name the children for you. And I'll tell you what I want you to name them when they're born. And so committed was Hosea the prophet to his prophetic office that he he gave his children names that were expressive of the judgments that were coming on his people via the Assyrian captivity of 722 B.C. And God often used the meaning of names to teach Israel certain truths. The first child he had on slide number 9, if you would, The first child he had was named Jezreel. It means God will scatter or sow. 
That's the name that God picked out for little, uh, the firstborn son of Hosea, the firstborn son and his family, little Jezreel, little Jezzy. And God, his name meant God will scatter or so. And, and by this little, this little baby and the name of this baby, he was indicating that, you know, uh, Israel too is going to be cast away if they don't recognize the folly of their actions. If they don't turn from their idols. They're going to, they're going to be scattered. And Jezreel was a living illustration of that. It's kind of like, it'd be kind of like us today naming our, you know, our kid World Trade Centers. Or naming our daughter Little September 911. Or something like that. It's these, these messages, these national messages from the names of the kids. And how awful that would be. And yet, Hosea the prophet was obedient. We see that in the first chapter, Hosea chapter 1, uh, that the text specifically says that she conceived and bare Hosea a son. His name, of course, was Jezreel. And then after this firstborn son, we don't see it that way in the text. We simply read that Gomer conceived. Not that she conceived his son or daughter. And so, she evidently is being promiscuous even early in her marriage with the Hosea the prophet. And she conceives a second time. Whose ever father this little daughter's was, was yet to be determined. Perhaps they will never know. But Lo Rama was the name, not compassionate or pitied was the meaning. And it meant that God would no longer have, be able to show pity and His love and His grace to a stubborn and rebellion peop, rebellious people. That the time would come when an invading army would check the rebellion. Little Lo Rama would be a living witness, a living testimony of this. A third child, a son, Named Loami, not my people. And somehow Hosea the prophet knew this, this uh, prophet who thundered the voice and the messages of God. Somehow he knew by the third child, there is no way this third child is mine. He named him Loami according to God's prompting. He names him Loami, which means not my people. This is not my baby. It's not mine. I know it for a fact. That this one is not mine. And God was saying, you have not kept your end of the covenant through this little baby. I'm not the one you love anymore. And so Gomer eventually deserted Hosea the prophet. And she fell into full-fledged prostitution. It went from from kind of catting around... uh, At night time and on weekends and here and there and ducking in and out... And she finally left home. And imagine the hurt and anguish and the sick feeling that filled Hosea's heart. Imagine the, the sleepless nights, the lonely days, the, the challenges of raising three children alone. And like I said, about this time, a new tone came into the prophet's ministry. And instead of telling people just about the judgment of, that God that was coming from God over their sin. Hosea the prophet begins to speak in tears because he was a broken man now. His marriage was shattered. His children, though they had mothers, were for all intents and purposes motherless. He had learned the bitter lesson of of life. And Israel would yet, uh, if, would yet reap the consequences of a, of a life and sins and transgressions sown. And yet, Hosea the prophet begins to proclaim this message. And God comes to him one day and he essentially says to Hosea, Hosea, I want you to go get Gomer. I want you to go to the red light district. I want you to find her pimp and I want you to buy her back. I want you to bring her home. And God said this will serve as a living story 
But even though Israel has abandoned me, I will not abandon them. And so, on slide number 4, if you would please, Hosea 3, verses 1 through 5, the Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again. But God, I don't want to go. I know what she's done. I have an idea where she's been. I, 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 I know what this means. I've been hurt. I've been broken. I don't want to go. And God said, Go. Show your love to your wife again. And I bet there were a lot of nights that Hosea wondered where his wife was. And what she was doing. And how many, how many men. And why them. And, and did they pleasure her and laugh with her and cherish her? Did they buy her things? Did they take her on trips? Did they, or, or, or were they mean and nasty? And did they rough her up and smack her around? Did she miss Hosea? Did she miss the kids? What was going on in his world? What was going on in her world? Oh, as a human being, I'd say all of those things were going on. And yet the Lord said to me, He writes, as Hosea writes, Go show your love to your wife again. And, and the word again points us back to uh, chapter 1 of the book. And, and, and here's what happens in the beginning of the book. And kind of mentioned it already. But... Uh, You know, God says, I want you to marry this woman. Her name is Gomer. This is what's going to happen. She's going to break your heart. And it wasn't a big deal, though, that God would say, Here, this is who I want you to marry. I mean, after all, the guy's a prophet. God says things like that. So that's not that big a deal. Prophets do what prophets do. They get revelations. They hear voices. They speak those. That's their job. They preach. They prophesy. So much, so good. And it's all ordinary and common up to this point. But when we see in chapter 1, God says, you know, this is who I want you to marry. But Jose, I want you to know something. She's going to break your heart. She's going to trample your heart. She's going to betray you. She's going to be unfaithful to you. She's going to be unfaithful to your family. And she's going to completely move out. And she's going to be with other lovers. And that's exactly what she does. She moves out of their home. She goes and she lives this life. Uh, She, it gets worse eventually and worse. And eventually we see in chapter 2 and in chapter 3, she's become a streetwalker of sorts and she is a prostitute. and, and, uh, And it's like, how much further can she fall? And yet by the time we reach chapter 3 of Hosea, what we realize now is that it's gotten much, much worse in her life because now she's on the bidding block. And how did she get there? And how much worse could it get for her? Some lover has strung her out. He got what he wanted and he used her up and now he's pawning her off. And she's on the bidding block and either she's fallen into debt somehow and that's one of the ways that people sold themselves into slavery is that they would try to uh, pay their debts and, and to have income that they could pay their debts. And so perhaps she's trying to pay her debts or perhaps it was a pimp that had lost her, she had lost her marketability and her pimp was cutting his losses while he could. But we know it's really, really bad in the life of Gomer. It's very interesting. The life of a prostitute is incredibly dark. 62% report being raped in prostitution. 75% of prostitutes attempt suicide. And they are exposed to lots of pornography. And many have lots of abortions. And their bodies are offered to the gods of sex. This was the life of Gomer. She never intended it to go this far. And the Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. They love the sacred raisin cakes. I mean, does God have a problem with dessert? Does he have a problem with cereal bars? I mean, for me, I like Little Debbie cream cakes. Those are pretty good. 
I'm not sure I'm crazy over the raisin cakes, but they're, you know, I understand it was probably a delicacy of the time. Dried grapes pressed together. And when you look into this, it becomes, this kind of becomes a figure of speech in the way that the prophets use this phrase. How they, Israel goes after their raisin cakes. Raisin cakes were, they were employed in feasts associated with Baal worship. And it was believed that, that uh, raisin cakes were sexual performance aids. It's the Old Testament version of Viagra in the day and time. If you don't know what that is, just Google it. Okay? I'm not going to explain it. But it's an aphrodisiac and it's, it's the thing that, it's the Old Testament form of Viagra and, and they would offer these and raisin cakes and they would consume these raisin cakes in the high places under every spreading tree as we talked about last week. Going after your raisin cakes became a, a figure of speech. You're in party mode and God is like, you love your raisin cakes. I just wanted you to love me. I made the raisins. I made the cakes. I made the body. I designed it for marriage. And you've just given yourself over to the bodily impulses of life and of what you think it is you want. You've left the romance of the story and the thrill and the drama of what I'm trying to do in the world and the promised seed I want to send through you, Israel. You've chosen raisin cakes instead of me. And with raisin on her breath, God said to Hosea, the prophet, I want you to love Gomer. And it w- we don't know all the details, but we, we don't know what kind of Hosea uh, husband Hosea might have been. We don't know what kind of home life Gomer had as a young girl. There's much that we don't know. But she made a decision to leave the man she married and the kids behind that she bore. A life without them looked so much more attractive to her and she was willing to risk it all. And maybe other men gave her the attention that she craved. They told her everything that she wanted to hear. Maybe they got her to laugh and they showed her a good time and... Maybe it felt good to get back at Hosea in some way. To even the score. Maybe she didn't like all this talk about going into captivity that he always seemed to like to talk about and he harped on day after day after day. If we don't change, it's going to go south and the world's going to be destroyed and we'll never, we'll never know what it means to be a nation again. And, and maybe she got tired of hearing that day after day after day. And she didn't want to be uprooted and deported. Maybe she was driven more by hate than by love and adultery was her way at getting back at Hosea or even God. I don't know what her core assumptions were. But an affair turned into prostitution and prostitution turned into slavery. And now the price was coming due. And like I said, there's a lot that happens between Hosea 3, 1 and 3, 2. But we see in Hosea chapter 3, verse, verse 2, So I, it's first person pronoun, Hosea's story in his own words. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic, uh, which is half a homer, about 10 bushels, the commentators tell us, of barley. And so for 15 shekels of silver and this amount of uh, goods would be another 15 shekels for basically uh, the commentators tell us 30 shekels would have been the equivalency of the price of a slave. But the real, the real issue is not how much, it's why he had to buy her at all. And she had apparently become the property of someone else. And Gomer may have become a temple prostitute, that's possible. But it seems she willfully left Hosea and things went south on her and she wanted brighter lights and greener grass. And now her life has been broken. She was being sold. And you know, when I look at Hosea's name, which means his name means salvation, I think about how this reminds me of somebody, how that we were all on a slave auction block 
and we, our lives weren't all put together at one time, that our lives were broken, that our maybe marriages were broken, that our relationships were broken, that our families were broken to the point that we wanted to leave them and never look back. And we've all been there. We've been there in one way or another, deep within the recesses of our life. We've been on the auction block. We've been broken. We've been naked. We've had our eyes shut because it's too painful to look. And somebody comes into our world and he comes into our dark places, into the seedy parts of our life, and he says, I'll pay the price. I'll pay the price. I'll do what's necessary to bring you home again. And Hosea the prophet says, I told her, verse 3, you are to live with me many days. In other words, you love them and leave them days are over. Gomer, I'll not be selling you to anyone else. You belong to me yet again. I paid the dowry once and we got married. I'll pay the slave auction price the second time. And I'm going to love you. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. And I will behave the same way towards you. I just want you to leave your sex addiction, your relationship addiction. I want you to come home. I want to love you. And I want this to be an illustration of how God loves His people. And I like how I like how this transpires. So she's up for sale and Gomer looks ragged and used. The life has gone out of her eyes. Her body language is shamed and defeat. Her hair hangs over her tired and weary countenance. And now here she is, a prophet's wife, a Baal worshiper, a sexual slave, and the bidding starts. And it's not hard to imagine. She probably does have her eyes closed. In those days when you bought a slave, you bought one who was naked or nearly naked because they wanted to see the condition of the slave that they're purchasing. And so here she is, five shekels and eight shekels, and suddenly she begins to realize the voice of one that she has heard in her distant past. Eight shekels. Ten shekels. Twelve shekels. Thirteen shekels. Fifteen shekels. And a lithic. A homer of barley sold to to Hosea. He walks up to her and he covers her nakedness. And he leads her away. And she's thinking, why do you still want me? Her first response was probably, oh, oh, I get it. Maybe this is revenge. And, And now you can do with me what you want to do. Now that I've bottomed out, you're, I know what you probably are scheming. And perhaps she thought the worst. And, and yet we see in verse 3 that it's, no, it doesn't, he's, that's not his intent. That's not his approach. He speaks tenderly to her. I want to dwell with you, he says. No, I don't want you as a slave. I don't want you as just, as just a, an ordinary household servant. I want you to be my wife again. I want you to come home. I want you to be here at our meal times and interact with the children and with me. And I want you to let us love you and to do life together. And, 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 and there's going to be a period though, uh, Gomer, that we're not going to sleep together. And, and God is going to use this period to help build us back. We just can't crawl in bed together again and pretend as if nothing has ever gone wrong. No, there's the heart. It's called deep heart. Emotional work of healing. And that's what it's called. And that's what we have to engage in when there's been this kind of break of trust he says it's going to be hard work but I'm going to buy, I bought you a second time I want you to come home I want you to be with us again and be in our family and so he does this hard work and if you've gone through a, a, a breaking of trust whatever that has been in your life it will take time He says, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. And I will behave the same way towards you. He says. And so if you've broken trust, it takes so much time to rebuild it. You can't just rebuild it overnight. It takes time. If you travel, give me your itinerary. It builds trust. Tell me if your lover tried to contact you. It builds trust. 
Tell me if you want to contact your lover and why you want to contact them. It opens up avenues of communication. It opens up an opportunity to communicate, to build trust. Call me during the day. Tell me what you love or respect about me. Plan time to be alone with me. Show me affection. Ask me how I feel. Don't attack me. Use an affirming tone. Take my hand when we walk. Buy buy a new bed if we have to. But let's work on forgiveness. Let's work on reconciliation. Let's stay with it. Let's do whatever's necessary to build trust again. Because digging out of the wreckage of a broken marriage... And a broken life and a broken trust is not easy to do. And Hosea understands that. J. Allen Peterson in The Myth of the Greener Grass says, People who have affairs have the child's longing to be touched, caressed, held, hugged, kissed, whether they admit it or not. They want a loving friend, a pal who who isn't judgmental. They want someone to convince them they're still loved, lovable, and very special. Even though they've broken and violated a trust. And Hosea the prophet seems to understand that. And now Hosea makes a national application. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. There's a loss of three pairs of things. King or prince, sacrifice or sacred stones, ephod or idol, The absence of king and prince implied a loss of national sovereignty. Israel, you're going to lose your national sovereignty. There's going to be an elimination of sacrifice and sacred stones. A cessation of formal religious activity, both legitimate and illegitimate. There's going to be an elimination of ephod and household gods. Devices used to determine uh, decisions outside of God's will or input. And afterward, Hosea says, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, they will come trembling to the Lord and to His blessings in the last days. And they will. And they will recognize the authority of the Davidic monarchy. And the divided kingdom will be united yet again under one king. And this king comes about 700 years later after Hosea the prophet writes these words. They will come trembling. You know, uh, someone has kind of put together a kind of a modern day retelling of the Hosea story. The Hosea and Gomer story. And I'm going to have you go ahead and roll that. And I'm going to kind of talk, talk us through it. And I'll just keep preaching and sharing a few of the things that, that we need to talk about here in this, in this story. Go ahead and roll that. And uh, just keep my mic on. Let me, let me continue to address some of these things. Thank you, God, for your love and grace and for this great story. And we ask and pray this morning that you would visit us and you would bring us home to your Father heart. And you would use our places of pain, our places of suffering, our family brokenness, our marriage brokenness, our relational brokenness, our financial brokenness, our social brokenness, our economic brokenness, our addiction brokenness, that you would use all of it in such a way that we we would become radical lovers like we've never loved before. Maybe our calling this morning is to love somebody that everybody in our family says we should hate. Oh, that sounds prophetic to me. Maybe this morning it is to fix dinner for a spouse that got home late and won't tell us why. This morning it might be to reach out across the assembly line and to help somebody that has been a thorn in our saddle from the first day of work. What radical, bizarre thing are you asking us to do today? 
Give us the heart of a Hosea. The spirit of an Isaiah. The determination of Ezekiel. Give us a voice. And we'll honor you with it. And we don't want to miss the relationship. We don't want to miss the love. We don't want to miss the romance. We don't want to miss the luring of our God. Thank you for hedging us in, Father. Thank you for hedging us in with the thorn bushes. We tried to go left and you hedged us in. We tried to go right and you hedged us in. Thank you for hedging us in in our wayward states. Thank you. And it is now that we want to see that what we wanted all along, we already had. In your identity, in your love, in your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you've been a great group this morning. And what radical thing might God be calling you to do? Will you stand with me? Keep praying for one another. Keep lifting each other up. Let God's grace be powerfully at work in your life. We'll see you next week for the story. Roll that final song. You, when the song starts playing, you're dismissed. Thank you, guys.